session 652. Good evening. Good evening, Seth. Now, dictation. Such a change in your waking and sleeping patterns very nicely helps cut through your habitual ways of looking at the nature of your own personal world and so alters your conception of reality in general. To some extent, there is a natural and spontaneous merging of what you would think of as conscious and unconscious activity. This in itself brings about a greater understanding of the give and take that exists between the ego and other portions of the self. The unconscious is no longer equated with darkness or with unknown frightening elements. Its character is transformed so that the dark qualities are seen as actually illuminating portions of conscious life, while also providing great sources of power and energy for normal ego-oriented experience. On the other hand, of ordinary behavior, no, on the other hand, areas of ordinary behavior that may have seemed opaque before, cloudy or dark, personal characteristic behavior that was not understood, for instance, may suddenly become quite clear as a result of this transformation, in which the shadowy aspects of the unconscious are perceived as brilliant. Barriers are broken down, and with them certain beliefs that were based upon them. If the unconscious is no longer feared, then the races that symbolized it are no longer to be feared either. There are many other natural and spontaneous kinds of comprehension that can also result from the waking and sleeping rhythms that I have suggested. The unconscious, the color black, and death all have strongly negative connotations in which the inner self is feared. The dream state is mistrusted and often suggests thoughts of both death and are evil. But changed wake-sleep habits can, again, bring about a transformation in which it is obvious that dreams contain great wisdom and creativity, that the unconscious is indeed quite conscious, and that in fact the individual sense of identity can be retained in the dream state. The fear of self-annihilation, symbolically thought of as death, can then no longer apply as it did before. As a result, other individually built-up beliefs that depended upon the existence of such opposites also spontaneously breaks down. I saw a large black-winged ant crawling on the back of Jane's rocker close to her head. The next second it was on her, head, on her neck. She jumped up in mid-delivery, brushing instinctively at something she couldn't have seen. Dazed, she sat, sank back into her chair. A bug will do it, she finally said. After resting briefly, she lit a cigarette and went back into trance. Do you have it? I read the last sentence aloud and Seth, aloud, and Seth Jane continued. When you find yourself as alert, responsive, and intellectual in the dream state as you are in waking life, it becomes impossible to operate within the old framework. This does not mean that in all dreams that particular kind of awareness is achieved, but it is often accomplished within the suggested wake-sleep pattern. A certain beneficial and natural situation is arrived at in which the conscious and unconscious minds meet. This occurs spontaneously, whatever your sleep patterns but is very brief and seldom remembered. The optimal state is so short because of the prolonged drugging of the conscious mind. Animals follow their own natural waking sleeping schedules and in their way derive far greater benefits from both states than you and use them with greater efficient effectiveness particularly along the lines of the body's built-in system of therapy. They know exactly when to alter their patterns to longer or shorter sleep periods, therefore adjusting the adrenaline output and regulating all of the bodily hormones. 
In humans, the idea of nutrition is also involved. With your habits, the body is literally, literally starved for long periods at night, then often overfed during the day. Important therapeutic information that is given in dreams and meant to be recalled is not remembered because your sleep habits plunge you into what you think of as unconsciousness far too long. The body itself can be physically refreshed and rested in much less than eight hours, and after five hours the muscles themselves yearn for activity. This need is also a signal to awaken so that unconscious material and dream information can be consciously assimilated. Many of your misconceptions about the nature of reality are directly related to the division you place between your sleeping and waking experience, your conscious and unconscious activity. Opposites seem to occur that do not exist in actuality. Myths, symbols, and rationalizations all become necessary to explain the seeming divergences, the seeming contradictions between realities that appear to be so different. Individual psychological mechanisms are activated, sometimes in terms of neurosis or other mental problems. These bring out into the open inner challenges or dilemmas that otherwise would be worked out more easily through an open give and take of conscious and unconscious reality. In the natural body-mind relationship, the sleep state operates as a great connector, an interpreter, allowing the free flow of conscious and unconscious material. In the kind of sleep patterns suggested, optimum conditions are set up. Neurosis and psychotic, neurosis and psychosis simply would not occur under such conditions, and in the natural back-and-forth leeway of the system, exterior dilemmas or problems are worked out in the dream situation, and interior difficulty may also be solved symbolically through physical experience. Illumination concerning the inner self may appear clearly during waking hours. No, during, let me start over. Illumination concerning the inner self may appear clearly during waking reality, and in the same way, invaluable information about the conscious self may be received in the dream state. There is a spontaneous flow of psychic energy with appropriate hormonal reaction in both situations. You do not have energy dammed up through repressions, for example, and emotions and their expressions their expression are not feared. In your present system of beliefs and with the dubious light in which the unconscious is considered, a fear of the emotions is often generated. Not only are they often hindered in waking life, but then, but censored as much as possible in dreams. Their expression becomes very difficult. Great blockages of energy occur which in your terms can result in neurotic or even stronger psychotic behavior. The inhibition of such emotions also interferes with the nervous system and its therapeutic devices. These repressed emotions and the whole charge behind such distorted concepts about the unconscious result in a projection outward upon others. In your individual area, there will be persons upon whom you will project all of those charged, frightening emotions or characteristics. At the same time, you will be drawn to those individuals because the projections represent a part of you. On a national basis, the characteristics or qualities will be projected outward onto an enemy. Within a nation, they can be directed against those of a particular race, creed, or color. You do not simply come upon your sleep patterns. They are not the result of your technology or industrial habits. Instead, they are a part of those beliefs that caused you to develop your technological industrial society. 
they emerged as you began to categorize experience more and more, to see yourself as separate from the spring or fountainhead of your own psychological reality. In natural circumstances, the animals, while sleeping at night, are still partially alert against predators and danger. There is within the innate characteristics of the mammalian brain, then, a great balance in which complete physical relaxation can occur in sleep while consciousness is maintained in a partially suspended, passive, yet alert manner. That state allows conscious participation and interpretation of unconscious dream activity. The condition gives the body its refreshment, yet it does not lie inert for such long periods of time. Mammals have also changed their habits to accommodate those conditions you have thrust upon them, so the behavior studied in laboratories is not necessarily that shown by the same animals in their natural state. Taken alone, this statement can appear deceptive. The alterations in behavior are themselves natural, of course. Animal consciousness is different than your own. With yours, a finer discrimination is necessary so that unconscious material can be assimilated. All of mankind's developments, however, are latent in the animal brain, and many attributes of which you are unaware are latent in your own. The biological pathways for them already exist. In your current beliefs, again, consciousness is equated in very limited terms with your conception of intellectual behavior. You consider this to be a peak of mental achievement growing from the undifferentiated perceptions of childhood and returning ignominiously to them again in old age. Such wake-sleep patterns as I have suggested would acquaint you with the great creative and energetic portions of psychological behavior that are not undifferentiated at all, but simply distinct from your usual concepts of consciousness, and these operate throughout your life. The natural experience of what you think of as time distortion, for example, occurring in childhood and old age alike, represent quite normal experiences of your basic time environment, much more so than the clock time with which you are so familiar. The patterns I have suggested, therefore, will bring you far closer to an understanding of the reality of your being and help you break down beliefs that cause personal and social division. The long period of continuous waking conscious activity is to some extent at variance with your natural inclinations. It cuts you off from the spontaneous give and take of conscious and unconscious material mentioned earlier, and of itself you see necessitates certain changes that then make your prolonged sleep period necessary. The body is denied the frequent rest it requires. Conscious stimuli is over-applied, making assimilation difficult and placing a strain upon the mind-body relationship. The division between the two aspects of experience begins to take on the characteristics of completely diverse behavior. The unconscious becomes more and more unfamiliar to consciousness. Those beliefs build build up about it and the symbolisms involved are exaggerated. The unknown seems to be threatening and degenerate. The color black assumes stronger tendencies in its connection with evil, something to be avoided. Self-annihilation seems to be a threat ever present in the dream or sleep state. At the same time, all of those flamboyant, creative, spontaneous, emotional surges that emerge normally from the unconscious become feared and projected outward then upon enemies, other races, and creeds. Sexual behavior obviously will be considered depraved by those most afraid of their own sensual natures. They will ascribe it to primitive or evil or unconscious sources 
and even attempt to censor their dreams in that regard. They will then project the greatest sexual license upon those groups they choose to represent their own repressed behavior. If sex is equated with evil, the other group will, of course, be considered evil. If the members of such a rigid group believe that youth is innocence, then they will deny sexual experience as having any place in childhood and alter their own memories to fit their beliefs. If a young adult believes that sex is good but old age is bad, then he or she will find it impossible to consider exuberant sexuality as a portion of an older person's experience. In the dream state, the child and the old man or woman can exist simultaneously, and the individual is made quite aware of the full range of creaturehood. The wisdom of the child and of the aged are both available. Lessons from future experience are also at hand. There are quite natural physical mechanisms in the body that provide for such interaction. You, des you deny yourself many of these advantages, however, through the artificial alienation that you have set up by your present wake-sleep patterns, to which, again, your ideas of good and evil are intimately connected. Those of you who cannot practically make any alterations in sleeping habits can still obtain some benefits by changing your beliefs in the areas discussed. Learning to recall your dreams and resting briefly when you can, and immediately afterwards recording those impressions that you retain. You must give up any ideas that you have as to the that you have as to the unsavory nature of unconscious activity. You must learn to believe in the goodness of your being. Otherwise, you will not explore these other states of your own reality. When you trust yourself, then you will trust your own dream interpretations, and these will lead you to greater self-understanding. Your beliefs of good and evil will become much more clear to you, and you will no longer need to project repressed tendencies out upon others in exaggerated fashion. In the dictation and of the session. Okay, let me skip down. Let me start right here. As I sat at my desk the next morning, April the 2nd, I was suddenly filled with the strongest, most vivid kind of inspiration I think I've ever had. I was swept along by it all day long, writing in a fever, agitated yet exultant. The result was a nine-page poem called dialogues of the speakers which may or may not continue into a book. This is the way the book of poetry that I finished early in March, Dialogue of the Soul and the Mortal Self in Time, began. As I came to the end of the long poem in mid-afternoon, I had more and more difficulty describing my feelings and even in typing. Here are the last two verses. Do the speakers live their massive lives straddle ours, and through the pupils of their eyes we look out upon a universe, but all that we know or see is but a detail in a scheme so overpowering that writing now I grow weak and cry that what I sense falls through my words, which cannot hold such inner evidence. I am left with gaps so huge that what is unsaid is all and there. What I cannot hold is what I am and what you are. My thoughts are as weak as my cupped hands to grasp these meanings. But our lives are like the shadows of my fingertips. So are we sent out by other ones, massive relatives in a family so vast, yet in which each member bask. As I struggled through these, my subjective state changed to such a degree that I called Rob again. I began to sense the speaker's massive lives, and I realized that I had gone beyond the poem. The inspiration was now directing my perception, so that as I looked around, the world was altered. When this happened to me, this state that we think of as subjective life turns real 
an objective. Hmm, lost my place. Oh, and is then viewed in the same way that our normal physical life is. There is never a complete process, but the transformation of inner data outward is a splendid, though sometimes disquieting, experience. From my desk to in my study, I faced the windows of our small kitchen. I could look through the treetops beyond them. We live on the second floor. And down to the street on the next block. Not three-dimensionally, but in another way more vividly, I saw or sensed massive figures standing around the edge of that physical view and around the edges of the world. My eyes were open, of course. With my inner sight, I felt that one of those forms, sturdy and impossibly massive, might bend down and with his gigantic face peek into my kitchen window, though I was also aware that all of this was my interpretation of what I was receiving. At the same time, in contrast, my perception of my room underwent a transformation. Everything in it, while retaining its own size to my vision, became microscopically small and dear, like a child's model of a world, but one that was real and living. With my rooms inside one of the innumerable toy houses, I was exhilarated yet disquieted. I tried to go along with what was happening, yet still retain a certain as if distance so that I wouldn't be completely lost in the experience. Rob suggested I take a nap since the Monroes were to arrive in an hour or so. While I attempted to sleep, one idea from amongst many sprang out at me, literally shocking me. We are in God. We were never externalized. These words do little to explain my emotional, subjective feelings of participation in this ideal, for suddenly I felt being in God as being in a house. Everything we imagine and know is inside. There is no outside. I felt claustrophobic for a bit. My visual perception was again altered in a strange, smoother way, so that everything I saw was an inside that was indeed itself ad infinitum. I felt dwarfed, but almost immediately came the oddest feeling of fantastic security, and I realized that being inside God, we were literally made of God stuff and were therefore eternal. Next came the feeling that this inside quality was so inconceivably vast that within it was all of the ever-expanding space possible. Only an inside could possess those characteristics of constant expansion. Each of these ideas came as emotional revelations accompanied by various bodily sensations and alterations of visual perception. In here, other experiences began, and to different degrees, I did get lost in them. One involved my body becoming massive, not as if it was massive, but massive itself. To all intents and purposes, I was massive lying there. I expanded in some way, rising higher. higher. Jane then experienced a whole series of events involving various facets of the concept of massiveness. While these were perfectly real to her physically, she also knew that they were symbolic interpretations of inner realities. We think the cellular memory that Seth described was also involved, as witness those excerpts from her account. The next thing, I knew I was back in bed, but massive again, and for a moment frightened. My left hand above me on the pillow had turned into an eagle's claw. My eyes were closed, but as far as physical sensation was concerned, that's what it was. I felt this fantastic power in my hand. It tried to grip as an eagle's claw would. I felt the weirdest kind of armor, the alien yet tough and resilient claw instead of flesh in our terms. Then my shoulders and the whole top area of my back began to turn into a great eagle, wings flapping. The surging power and alien sensations were aston astonishing. 
In a process impossible to describe, another change took place. This time, I was a dinosaur. I mean, I was one. I stood on two legs, making loud, hoarse, and guttural noises of exultation as I stood upon a great plain. There was a similarity between the eagle and the dinosaur in that body armor, or whatever, that strange toughness. These were all stages that I had been through, or at least that some of the cells in my body remembered. But the immediacy was very vivid on my part. Rob called me, then left to pick up the Monroes at the hotel. I felt exhilarated to a high degree, yet exhausted. I began to dress, still aware of the inside God feeling. The birds began to sing outside, and I, was, and I stopped, transfixed. The birds were the gods singing. This wasn't a symbolic or, or artistic sensation. This was sudden, known fact. The incredible sweetness of their songs followed me even while I found myself laughing. For now, I was touching up my nails. I'd worn off all the new polish on their edges from typing my speaker poetry all day. And inside, God or not, here I was, quite capable of thinking in such mundane terms. As I went into the living room to prepare it for guests, that room was also an inside that was an outside. No, that room was also an inside that was an inside. Echoes of Jane's transcendent experience persisted for days. She also recalled details she had omitted from her written record. Usually the memory of these was triggered by ordinary events in our daily lives. Those who are interested can check out the references in the next two paragraphs. Seth deals with cellular memory to some extent in the 638th session, chapter 10. Also see the 632nd and 637th ses session. I'm going to skip some of that. I'll stay on it for a while in case anyone wants to look at this in print here. No session was held Monday evening. Instead, Jane used her own abilities to tune in on the diagram of a machine that Bob Mun Munro drew. He had seen this in one of his out-of-body journeys. Questions involving physics arose. The Fermi gap having to do with the movement of certain electrons and so forth. And Jane ended up drawing diagrams of her own. She enjoys using her abilities this way. She gave her notes and drawings to Bob on Tuesday then, beside writing about her transcendent episode, she wrote an account of Monday evening's discussion and reconstructed her notes and sketches for her own records. Well, I feel Seth around, Jane said, tonight at 9.22. I'll be ready in a minute. It's funny, but as I sit here waiting, I feel a great sense of color and expectation. I often do. It's almost the same high-flying feeling I get when I do some good poetry, like on Monday. Off came her glasses. Good evening. Good evening, Seth. Dictation. Your attitudes towards sleep, dreams, or any alterations of consciousness are all colored to some extent, then, by beliefs concerning good and evil in your Western society. These emerge from the old Puritan work ethic. The devil finds evil work for idle hands. This kind of thinking by itself brings about an overall attitude in which rest is frowned upon and dreams are considered suspect. Daydreaming and even mild alterations of consciousness take on moral connotations. Such ideals are mirrored in your society in innumerable fashions and in areas in which values of good and evil are not apparent. Active sports are considered good, however, but often contrasted to passive, intuitive activities which are then seen as bad. You insist upon a material product of some physically demonstrative kind. In that context, dreams or daydreams are not viewed as constructive or productive. Young people are urged to tackle life aggressively, but in the usage of the term, this means competitively. It also implies, and of course, 
promotes the direction of individual consciousness in an exterior fashion only. Not only is consciousness to be focused to the external reality, but within those limits it is still further harnessed towards certain specific goals. Other inclinations are frowned upon. Such individuals are trained to consider any alterations of consciousness, any seemingly passive endeavor as dangerous to one degree or another. An, or an artist will be tolerated only if his work sells well, for example, in which case it will be thought that the artist is simply trick, trickier than most uh, in discovering a way of making trickier than most in discovering a way of making money. The writer is put up with if books result in either fame or fortune. The poet is scarcely tolerated, for usually his or her gifts bring neither. The dreamer, whatever his age, job, or family background, is considered most suspect, for it seems that he doesn't even have a craft to excuse his moral laziness. People with such beliefs will find it most difficult to understand the creativity of their own being. The work done in dreams, the multidinudious experiences encountered there, will be invisible to them. They will have little regard or respect for the dreamers or visionaries of the world and will be the first to leap upon those in their own generation who display such tendencies. For all of this, however, inner portions of each individual's being are not touched by those beliefs. The ideals will be reflected in their daily experience, certainly, and seem to be justified. Yet, beneath, the inner self is quite aware of the great thrusting creativity that occurs in dreams and realizes that the source of individual energy has nothing to do with such superficial concepts as the nature of good and evil. Take your break, for that is the end of the chapter. And the next chapter will be chapter 14, Which You, Which World, Your Daily Reality as the Expression of Specific Probable Events. And I'll talk to you later. Bye for now.